In the first reading today, St. Paul says to the people that they accepted the gospel as he preached it, and they are being saved by the gospel if they continue as he preached it. That's exactly the situation where we're at now. There is only one means of salvation, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other means to save our souls. There is no other means for us to be able to get to heaven. But when our Lord came into this world, he didn't just simply say to us that we have to accept him. We have to accept the fullness of who he is. In other words, he taught us about a lot of things. It's not just enough to say that I believe in Jesus and then be able to say that now I can go out and keep sinning all that I want. Because as long as I believe in him, I'm going straight to heaven anyway. Now there are lots of Christian people, people who call themselves Christian anyway, who seem to believe that these days. It's a gospel other than the one that Jesus taught. When we read the scriptures, we don't see Jesus saying, go ahead and sin. Now he knows that we're sinners and he's given us the opportunity to have our sins forgiven and the means by which our sins can be forgiven. Remember what he did, he would say, go and sin no more. Otherwise, something even worse is going to overtake you, he told the people. He didn't say, as long as you believe that I open the eyes of this blind man or whatever, therefore you're saved. No, that wasn't enough. We have to believe that number one, he is the son of God, that he is God. And therefore what he spoke is the word of God. So if we are going to believe the gospel as St. Paul preached it, when we look at St. Paul's writings, he teaches us about the moral life. He teaches us about the spiritual life. He teaches us that we're to keep our focus on the Lord, that we are to seek union with Jesus, not just to have some generic belief, but to seek union with our Lord. So we have to start even with the point that I just made, union with our Lord. Is Jesus Lord? Oh, he is objectively. Is he your Lord? That's the critical question. Is he the Lord of your life? Each one of us can ask that. Is he the Lord of my life? Not just simply do I believe that he died to save my soul, am I living my life for him? Is he the one who's at the center of my life? Does everything in my life revolve around him? Because that's what it means to call him Lord. It means that he's the master and therefore I will be obedient to what he teaches me. I will do what he asks of me. Are we doing that? We can ask ourselves, how much time every day do I spend in prayer? If we look at what traditionally has been considered tithing, it's 10%. That means prayer should be two and a half hours a day out of a 24 hour day. So how much time is spent in prayer? I know we don't have two and a half hours to be able to spend in prayer. So let me change the subject slightly. How much time do you spend on your stupid telephone? How much time do you spend in front of the computer? How much time do you spend in front of the blasted TV set? But we don't have time to pray because we're too busy. Mm Mm-hmm turn a few of these stupid things off, and we'll have plenty of time to pray. You see, it's all a question of priority. We make time for what is important to us. 
And if all we're doing is giving lip service to Jesus, he's not important to us. If we're not spending the time for our blessed Lord, he's not important to us. You might look at it and say, well, I mean, two and a half hours. <laughs> what am I going to do for two and a half hours? You can come to daily mass. You can pray your rosary. You can read scripture. You can do mental prayer. You can do spiritual reading. There are lots of things that we can do. There are chaplets, there are novenas, there are all kinds of things that we can fill up way more than two and a half hours. Now we look too at what happened in the, in the gospel reading today. They bring to Jesus this man who's deaf and dumb and ask him to lay hands on him. Instead, Jesus takes the man off by himself, sticks his fingers in his ears, and then spits on his tongue. Now that, to us, seems rather disgusting. Jesus could have done this any way that he wanted. He healed people by simply speaking. He healed people by simply touching them. But for whatever reason, for this particular individual, there was something that was more that was needed. Just laying his hands on this man apparently wouldn't have been sufficient for the individual. It would have been sufficient to heal him. That wouldn't have been the problem. Obviously, the man needed something else. Jesus, being God, knows exactly what we need. And he will set things up in our lives exactly as is going to be best for us. But he opens this man's ears and he loosens his tongue. And so it's a great opportunity again then for us to look at that and not only recognize what a gift it is to be able to hear and to be able to speak, but now ask ourselves, what do I do with those faculties? In hearing confessions, I can tell you, that probably by far the most frequent sins that we hear are sins of the tongue. Gossiping, calumniating, detracting, lying, whatever it may be. There are literally confessions that after a person is done, they go through their whole list, I can say to them, did you notice that every single thing that you said came out of your mouth? They didn't confess anything else that they did. It was only what they spoke. How easy it is to sin with our tongue. What a gift it is to be able to speak. And how often we use that for the wrong reason. The same is true with our hearing and with our sight. How much do we fill ourselves with stuff that's not good? Listening to trash, whether that's trash music, whether that's trash that's some of this talk radio stuff that's nothing but foolishness. Whatever it is, what are we filling ourselves with? We're supposed to use all of our faculties to glorify God. Now, I know back a number of years ago, somebody told me that you basically can't go to a movie today that they don't use the Lord's name in vain at least a half a dozen times. Then we shouldn't be going to the movies. Why would we support something that is going to be using the name of our Lord in vain? Maybe because we do it ourselves. Because everyone else around us is doing it, so we just need to fit in. How often does God's name come out of your mouth in a way that is not holy? Because we're angry. Because we're surprised. Because we really want to make the point 
So we use God's name? When I was over at St. Agnes every year when I would go through the examination of conscience with the kids, the high school kids, I would say to them, think about using the name of your own mom the way you use God's name. Would you do that? The kids say, no. I said, why not? Well, it's because you love your mom too much. You would never use your mother's name that way. Right. We're supposed to love God more than our moms with our whole heart and soul and strength, and yet out his name comes. I went to a play recently at a place that does almost exclusively Catholic plays. The ones that aren't Catholic are good. So I went to this play. Wouldn't recommend it to anybody, but that's beside the point. There was one character in the play who was supposed to be a Frenchman. So the very heavy French accent, this man was playing whatever part. And the only two words that he spoke in French were to blaspheme God. Everything else was in English with a heavy French accent, except the blasphemy against the most precious blood of Jesus. But I went to somebody's house one day a number of years ago to bless their house, and there was a cartoon that was on. I think it was a Disney program. We all know what Disney's all about. I have no idea what the name of the cartoon was, but some of you will probably know because it was something where all kinds of kitchen implements or dining room implements came to life. There was a teapot and there was a candlestick and there was whatever, and they all came to life. And one of them was a Frenchman. And over and over and over again, in the couple of minutes that I was there where the stupid TV was, the blasphemy against the precious blood over and over and over. And here the little kids were watching this. But when I was in Israel, I was watching some kids play basketball one day. And every time they missed a shot, they would scream out the name of Jesus Christ. And I called them over and I said, do you guys know what you're saying? And they smiled and said, yeah. That's the American way to swear. Isn't that wonderful? What we have taught the world to use the name of our Lord in vain. And they were proud that they knew how to swear like an American. What comes out of our mouths? Dirty jokes, stupidity, gossip, slander, filth, using God's name in vain? How often do we take this gift of speech and use it to glorify Satan instead of glorifying God? You can ask the same thing with your hearing. You can ask the same thing with your sight. What do we use them for? All of these things God has given to us so that we could receive the truth, so that we could receive beauty. And so often we do just the opposite. And so we are to recognize, as Jesus told us, if we're to love God with our whole heart and soul and strength, it's our whole being, with our senses, with our bodies, with our soul, everything that we've got were to love God. And so St. Paul preached the gospel to these people, the gospel that would save their souls. They needed to hold on to it. And right now that gospel is being twisted. It is being perverted. We're being told that things are okay. 
that the church has condemned for 2,000 years. We're being told that we have to accept all of these things, that somehow these things that we know are completely debased, somehow we're being told these are normal. Remember what St. Paul told the the Galatians, if anyone preaches to you a gospel other than the one that we preached, let him be anathema. We're being preached a different gospel these days. And tragically, just as St. Paul said of them 2,000 years ago, we're willing to listen to it. We're willing to accept it. We're willing to reject the truth and we're willing to accept these things that are totally contrary to the truth. So salvation comes through the the good news, through the hearing of the good news and the acceptance of it, not just hearing it, accepting it. That's what all of us need to be about. Are we really studying our faith? We're living in a time where catechesis is a disaster, and it has been for over 60 years. So anybody my age and younger, you didn't get much. What are you doing to be able to learn? What are you doing to form your soul? Again, how much time is spent in prayer? How much time is spent in spiritual reading? How much time is spent trying to develop the spiritual life and to put the focus on Jesus. He and he alone will save our souls. He is the truth and he is love. What more would we be looking for? What more would we want? That's all we're going to do for eternity. That's what we should be doing now. So it's a great challenge for all of us to think about. To look at what St. Paul preached, what these people received, and that's the same gospel that was given to us. Are we accepting it? Do we know it? Or are we willing to accept something contrary? Are we filling our minds, our hearts, through our eyes, through our ears, with the truth? Are we speaking the truth with our mouths? Are we glorifying God with our tongues? Those are the kinds of things we can be looking at. So it goes back to that question, is Jesus really, truly the Lord of my life? Look at what I fill my life with. Listen to what comes out of the mouth. Is it really glorifying God or is it glorifying something else? Who or what really is the Lord of my life? What is most important to me? Those are the questions we all have to be looking at because none of those other things can save our souls. None of those other things is going to bring us to heaven. So it's fine to have good things in your life that aren't necessarily religious per se, no problem. As long as they're good, as long as they're not gravitating against your soul. We need to make sure we're doing everything to build up our soul. Everything around us is trying to pull it down. We need to be doing our part to build it up. Make sure we're reading the Gospels, reading Scripture, so that we've got the Word of God there listening to the truth, putting good things into our lives, that good things are coming through our eyes and our ears, good things are coming out of our mouths, and that we are only using God's name in a holy and reverent way. Those are things all of us can do very easily. The question is, do we want to? And the only way that we will really want to do that is if Jesus Christ really is the Lord of my life.